I, I want to thank you, Joe, for indicating oh, that there is a, the training here in Kenya, and perhaps we can be able to link up and see what lessons we can be able to draw. The identity crisis is here with us, and not just because people have moved from other nations, but even from those born in our time, my time and the time of my daughters is totally different. And so the identity is a challenge in terms of who we are, but we have a mission to continue offering. So thank you, Geoff, uh, for that time. That's so who is our next speaker? Is it uh, David? Patrick Johnston. Patrick Johnston, okay, thank you. Uh, Patrick Johnston, we want to welcome you. Uh, to speak to us, we are clergy and lay people enthusiastic about mission, and we trust God that we'll be able to grasp the gems that you shall lay out to us. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so you can start now, Patrick. Okay, I will. Um, I'm just trying to get my view right. Um, have you given me a, a screen share? Yes, yes, I do. Yes, we can see you. Yes. Um, my apologies that I'm not sure if I've got um, my power. Oh, yes, here it is. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Okay. Um, just to say thank you very much for the invitation that I can be with you and share at this time. I'm speaking from England and it's in the middle of our winter. And so you might see I've got lots of clothing on because we are suffering from the war in uh, Ukraine. It means that our fuel supplies are very expensive and we try to avoid heating our homes too much. And so that we are very, really part of this difficult world that Jeff was mentioning earlier. And so before I begin, I just want to um, commit this time to the Lord. Let's really pray that God might speak and we really depend on him uh, as we move ahead. So let's pray. Loving Father, we just want to thank and praise you that you are Lord of the universe, Lord of our world, and you have a plan for our world and our longings that we fit in with what you want of us. You've put us here for this time. You have a special uh, work for each one of us to do as part of your kingdom. And I pray that this day, as we meet together, may be part of your plan in the lives of every one of us present. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, Amen. <clears throat> first, um, do you want to say anything, Jeff? I, I, I don't see any, um, I, don't, I don't have the view I just have the full view and I'm trying to get. Um... Yeah, okay. Do you want me to just a minute? So did you did you press the button share screen? I, I did press the share screen. Yeah. Um, if you so I've. Wait, I've lost. I can do it for you if you want. Okay, help me. Yeah, sure. But I have I to- I want to see myself as well. Yeah. That's better, thank you. Okay. Um, my apologies, I'm still not quite um, okay, 
Well, basically, I just want to share a little bit on the personal side before I introduce my topic. And you may be surprised to hear, but I was in Kenya for five months uh, over the time of Uhuru. And I was in the stadium when Kenya became independent. And uh, that may show how old I am, but I've been, uh, I became a Christian at university. Uh, I was studying to be a scientist, but then God saved me. I was really in desperate situation myself. Just a year before, my father had drowned in the sea and I had lost my father and all that that meant for our family. It really caused great distress in our family. And in my own distress, that opened my heart for the Lord Jesus. And I was actually led to the Lord by an ordinand who was studying at <clears throat> Clifton Theological College, which now is known as Trinity College in uh, Bristol. And so that is a little bit of my background there. But then God called me to South Africa. And I went out with a little mission working amongst uh, the slum dwellers of Southern Africa. And during the course of my uh, early years, I was asked to go and join our little team in Nairobi. And so I spent that five months in Nairobi. I quickly learned quite a lot of Swahili. I've lost, uh, forgotten Nime, Nime Sahau Ki Swahili Changu. So <laughs> you can see my problem. I learned it, but I've forgotten it. But then I was asked to lead our first team of the little evangelistic mission of which I was part to go to Zimbabwe, which was then Rhodesia. So I was working in Southern Africa all through the time of apartheid. And I was working with a, a team of African brothers and sisters. And we had this constant issue of identity and feeling pushed down by the political system. And so I became almost like the sort of go between, between the system and my African workers. But I long to see my African workers become men and women of God. And indeed, over that time I was there, I saw these people develop to become leaders. And one um, especially was Steve Lungu, I will show him later on. Um, the, that he was, he became a well-known speaker all over the world. He was the leader of Africa Enterprise for some years, but he sadly died during the COVID time in Malawi. Anyway, I served God for 16 years in Africa. And during that time, um, I learned a, a bit of 10 languages. In our little team, we had four languages we used all the time. And so when Jeff spoke about language learning and multiculturalism in teams, it is something that I've grown up with in Christian work. And I would just suggest a rule for you that whenever you go to a new area and you find a new language, you must start to learn that language the first day you are there. If you delay, you will never learn it. And in Zimbabwe, I learned Shona and Ndebele, the two main languages of the country. But we were up in the northwest of the country, and I heard a language I could only hear a few words of. And so I asked, what is this language? And I found a new language for me that hardly any Zimbabweans knew about. It's called Nambia. And so I uh, got to know an African brother, and we worked together to translate the Gospel of John into that language over the years that followed. And so you never know when you go to another country how God is going to use you. Hence my suggestion that if you go to a new country, learn the languages there. And I've kept this through my life. I'm now 84 years old but I'm learning a new language at the moment. I'm learning the Iranian language, Farsi. And so now I can read the Bible a bit in Farsi. 
and speak a very little bit, but I am learning. And I think that will help me to uh, get older and my brain to still remain clear. But for the, then, after 16 years in Africa, I also, during that time, I wrote a book called Operation World. And um, wait a minute, I'll try and get to it. I don't know. Um, I can't move my, um, uh, Jeff, I can't move my, I, I'm not in control of the. Um, so I'll control it for you. No, well, I, I, I really need to be able to control it, but I, I don't see, oh, that's better. Okay. I think I will be able to now. No, I can't. Yeah, you can't. Do, do you want me to start? Start at the beginning. Right at the beginning. That's not the beginning. So this is the beginning, actually. Oh, sorry. Yes, because oh, I've got another version uh, that yeah. I added a few things to. Okay. So anyway, um, so I'll, I'll just carry on. But uh, during my time in, um, in Africa, I started to write about prayer information. This is something I did in Kenya. Um, we had a week to pray for the world. We invited Christians to meet in Nairobi, and we had a whole week praying for different countries of the world. And I was leading that, and I needed information about different countries. And I found to my amazement that hard, people knew hardly anything about different parts of the world. So I typed out a whole lot of information on some sheets of paper, and people were so appreciative of that information that they then uh, uh, used it for prayer. And when I went back to South Africa, the leader of the mission said, Patrick, you ought to put the, that information into a book. And so I did. And I wrote the book, and it was then 30 pages long and called Operation World. That book has now become quite famous in many editions that have been printed uh, over the years and, and, and improved every time. And so this book made me quite well known around the world because it was the only information that people could easily get hold of um, to know what is going on in the, in the different countries of the world. But this then also led to an invitation for me to join WEC, the WEC International, the mission that Jeff and I are part of, that I'd become part of the leadership team based in Britain. And so in uh, 1979, I left Africa and uh, lived in the UK. And then I've been part of the leadership of the mission until my retirement a few years ago. And so I've had the privilege of being involved as an evangelist, as a disciple maker, and then as a strategist for world mission. The last book I wrote um, about the world was called The Future of the Global Church. And many of the illustrations that I am using in this presentation, I prepared for that book, which was written about 10 years ago. And it looks to the future, what it's likely to, what the situation is likely to be and how it will affect Christian work. I'm quite pleased still with what I predicted because I have not been very far wrong in what I suggested might happen over the following 40 years. And so many of the illustrations I will use are based on that, but I further developed it and brought it up to this year of 2023. And just to also add, that I am, I'm living in a city called Derby in the UK. And during the time of COVID, we actually moved congregation. And I'm now part of a little congregation, uh, a new birth congregation in an Anglican church nearby us. And it was a dying congregation, 
but then a team um, basically from Holy Trinity Brompton, which may be known to you through the Alpha course, um, sent a team to bring new life to that church. And so now we have, after three years, we have a congregation of about 150 people, most of them in their 20s and 30s, and with many babies and children. And it is a total contrast to the average church in this country. And I was, I'm was i helping in the present Alpha course. And uh, last Tuesday, we were meeting. I had a Nigerian brother who was helping me in the team. And part of our group was a group of uh, Angolan refugees from Africa. And in our congregation, we have quite a wide variety. So it just illustrates the kind of things that Jeff was sharing with you earlier. So that's a little bit about my own background. And now I just want to take you to God's word. And as you can see, um, the title of what I've given you here is something I shared with a Nigerian mission a few, year, uh, a few months ago, but I've adapted it for our present uh, situation to you. But that's the background to it. And with this particular Nigerian mission, Capro or Calvary Ministries, um, I've alongsided them for the last 40 years as they've grown to become a very significant mission to Muslim peoples, especially. And they're based in Nigeria, but they've become very international and really a sister mission of my own. And so that's a little bit of my pedigree. And so when Jeff was speaking about how you, as an Anglican diocese, can get involved, uh, you can see how uh, we can work together to do all sorts of things. And it's best to do things together and not alone. Anyway, I want to take you now to God's word, and I, I, we'll go to Matthew 24. And here Jesus is speaking very solemnly with his disciples about the situation that will occur in the world and the years that follow his ascension to heaven. So I'll read from verse 1, and I'll read down to verse 14 in Matthew 24. I'm re reading from the Revi Revised Standard Version. And Jesus left the temple and was going away. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, but he answered them, Do you see all these? Sure, truly, I say to you, there'll not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. <clears throat> As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign of your coming and at the close of the age? Just a little aside. Notice they ask three different questions. And Jesus answers all three questions. And it's a bit hard to know which question he's answering. But carry on. And Jesus answered, take heed that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. All this is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because wickedness is multiplied, most men's love will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. I'll be concentrating more on that last verse. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And um, now to look at trying to understand this. There is the verse I want to emphasize. Um, can you move on, uh, Jeff? 
and the context um, the context of what Jesus was saying was the destruction of the temple uh, carry on and this was a model uh, uh, illustrating what the temple of Herod probably looked like at the time of Jesus. It was a magnificent building. It had only, it wasn't even complete at the time when Jesus was there. They were still building it. So it was new and beautiful. And so when they went to the temple, the disciples pointed out probably new parts that had been brought in, into operation. And they marveled at it, at this uh, great temple. And move on. And there you can see what is left of it, because the Romans came uh, 40 years later, as Jesus warned would that the enemy would come and destroy it. And this is all that is left of that temple. And that is the, those are the foundations of the um, temple um, and the great stones that were built upon which the temple was built. And it is part of uh, the one place of the temple where the Jews can go and pray today. And so, of course, it's a very controversial area. Move on. But the Jesus then, when asked, when the disciples were so surprised, when is all this going to happen? And he said, really, it's not just a destruction of the temple that he wanted to speak about, but also the end of the world. And so somehow in Jesus's response is bringing together the destruction of the temple and also the end of the world. And so we have to look quite hard to work out which one Jesus was referring to. But we have the problem that the disciples asked those three questions and Jesus answered them all. Move on. But then he went on and he spoke about the huge hardships that were going to come in the intervening time before the destruction of the temple and before the return of Jesus. And he told us of all these different things that would happen. Move on. And we read about wars. And he told of wars and rumors of wars. And here are just a few illustrations I've put together. The terrible civil war going on in the South Sudan, um, which is still raging, and how many millions have been made refugees, child soldiers, hatred between tribes. You know, one of the beautiful things to me when I was in Kenya, it was the time of the last few years of the East African revival that has so affected the mainline denominations in Kenya to this day. And um, we went every week, we went on Sunday afternoon in Pumwani to the uh, St. John's Church there for the Revival Brethren meeting. And to me, it was a beautiful time in my life because that seeing a work of the Holy Spirit that God did in Uganda, Rwanda, and uh, Kenya. Sadly, that's faded now because of pride and various things. But one of the strong statements that people made in those days was that tribalism was crucified on the cross with Jesus which I thought was very powerful. South Sudan is an example of what has gone wrong. And so we are told that there'd be hatred between peoples and wars. And we've seen a lot of that in the last few years. In fact, I'm just writing an article at the moment about the Sahel. The Sahel is that great area of Africa, I'll show in a minute, um, where um, there are so many wars going on at the moment. Could you move on, please? And here you can see conflicts in West Africa in October 2019. A lot more has happened since then. 
In fact, my last visit to Africa was just as COVID was coming. I went to speak at a conference in Burkina Faso. You can see that's just north of Ghana and south of Mali, and you can see all the green dots. That means high intensity fighting. Jihadists from the north had come and invaded uh, Burkina Faso, and they have such a limited army, they were not able to defend themselves. And so there are now a million refugees in Burkina Faso because of jihadist Islamists. And so it is a very difficult situation. And so right across that whole area today is warfare. Jesus warned us that this would happen. Move on. And there you can see refugees, Malian refugees in Niger. And look at the countryside. You, you'd be familiar with this type of country in the north of Kenya. But uh, this is now in West Africa. Move on. But now just to give you some kind of idea of, of the kind of world we're living in. And this speaks about superpowers. And what I've done here is I've shown the time from the time of Jesus until our present time, or nearly our present time, up to 2000. And you can see who the superpowers were at the different times in church history. At the time of Jesus, the main powers in the world were Rome, the Roman Empire, which of course ruled in Palestine where Jesus was, and he was very aware of the Roman situation, and the Roman soldiers beat him. Then there's the Persian Empire, and it's their language or a modern version of their language that I'm trying to learn now. And then China, and the trade between these three made those empires wealthy. But then as we go on through history, you can see the different centuries. And suddenly you see the Arabs emerging, Islam, that's the green. And what had happened was that Rome and the Persians had suffered terribly with a plague. They, had, they were fighting each other many wars they had between them, but then came the, a plague and a huge proportion of the Persians and Romans were killed by the bubonic plague. And it has its parallels to COVID today. Though the death rate then was much higher than with COVID uh, now. But the result was that both empires became so weak that the Arabs who lived in the desert were not affected in the same way. And when Muhammad gave them an ideology, they then went out to conquer much of the uh, world and that center part of the world, which they then controlled for over a thousand years. And I think that we need to realize why Muslims feel as they do. They were the they were the leading power in the world for a thousand years, but over the last three or four hundred years, they've lost it and they resent it. And so the jihadists want to restore the glories of their past and go on to conquer the world. That's what they believe should happen with Islam. And so it really gave the ideology for the present jihadist turmoil that has so affected our world. And you can see the same kind of thing happening with Russia today in invading Ukraine, because they felt that their world, which they once had so much control under communism, they're losing it and they want to regain it. And so warfare has been a factor in all of history. And we have to realize that that will go on until the end. We can be peacemakers, we can do what we can, but basically Jesus warned us that there'd be wars and rumors of the world, wars. But the interesting thing is that in this passage, he says, do not be alarmed, for this must.
take place. And as Jeff was sharing with us earlier about the huge increase in the number of refugees, I will return to that later, but the huge number of refugees today is giving us new opportunities for witness that we have not had before. And so Jesus warned us about that. Jeff, move on. And now I want to show you the Muslim world, because this is a very real world that we live in. And if we're going to evangelize the least evangelized parts of the world, most of them are in these countries where Islam is strong. Now, this is a, a, a kind of... Okay, I want, uh, uh, are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, fine. Okay. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, good. Wonderful. But here you can see um, a, a map with the countries more or less in the position where they are geography, uh, in geography. But the size of them is the size of their population projected for the year 2050. So look at the size of Pakistan. They're going to have a population of nearly 500 a million. And Egypt, look at that huge population in Egypt. It's unsustainable. But basically, you can see there the Muslim world. But the thing that is most affecting the Muslim world is what is happening in the center. Do you see the darker area? Iran and Iraq, and we think of the wars going on in the Middle East, and most of them are because of the hatred within Islam, that the Shia and the Sunni Muslims, the Sunni light green, the Shia dark green, and mixed where the uh, green hatching is, most of the wars in the, in the Muslim world are because of the hatred between these two main streams of Islam. But then I looked hard at this part of the world and I drew You can hear you, Patrick. Please unmute your microphone. Keep on unmuting it. What's going on? Anyway. Um, here you can see that this conflict that is taking place in Islam. Um, can you move to the next one, Jeff? And most of the major wars in the Middle East are in this area. And notice how um, this is all part of Syria and Turkey too. And the, the earthquakes that have taken place there are right in a terrible conflict zone. And that is why there's so much suffering in Syria. Next one. But then I drew circles on the countries of the Muslim, where Muslims live. I wanted to show where there would be civil unrest or threat in the orange, and with the red, where there's likely to be war. I then did not realize when I drew this in 2010, how bad things would get in Libya. And in Libya, they had the, the, the outside nations forced Gaddafi out of office and he died, but the result was terrible civil war in Libya with international involvements on both sides. And the weapons from that country have spread across the Sahel, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, and so on. And they've provided the weapons for war. So I put orange there as the circles, but they've actually become red. And so what we see in the Muslim world is this massive increase of violence. Now, this is not... Uh, there is a uh, there are, that is, there is some good in 
in the results, though the, the wars are terrible, but one of the results is many Muslims are now beginning to question the validity of their religion. And so since uh, all this 21st century, we've seen more Muslims come to know Jesus than ever in history. And so we can rejoice that even in the midst of horrible war, it is actually opening Muslim hearts to Jesus. I will come to the Somalis, for instance. Jeff mentioned the, the, the fact that you in Kenya have the one of the largest refugee camps in the world. You're all too well aware of the Somali problem. You've had troops in the country and, and so on. But the Somalis are beginning to open up a bit of the gospel as a result of what's happening in the tragic situation in their country. Jeff, move on. Move on. But then we have the other thing. Jesus warned that there would be false prophets. And we have seen this so much happening across the world, how Christians have been diverted from the main message. Uh, think of uh, that health and wealth in Africa, the prosperity teaching that has so affected many uh, new denominations in Africa with prophets and apostles coming up. And they're really just like another pope and how they become wealthy in the process. And it has brought disrepute to the gospel. And even within our Anglican communion, we have the awful situation going on at the moment about what is the future. And um, it's of deep concern to us all that we remain true to the truth of the gospel. And so there are many false teachings that have affected us and we must be aware that Jesus warned us that this would happen. Next. But then the COVID virus. Jesus warned us that there would be famines and earthquakes and diseases and all these kind of things. We mustn't be surprised at this. Move on to the next one. And this was a natural disaster that took place a few years ago. Some of you might remember it. It even affected the Mombasa area, that earthquake in uh, Sumatra, Indonesia, where, in the, the tsunami that went out so affected so many parts of the world and so many people died. Okay, move on. move on. So we need to look at how COVID has affected us. What is changing? And I was very interesting, interested to see how Jeff developed this about the huge changes that are taking place in the world. And most of us don't realize how big they are. And I, I think that the kind of change we are seeing in the world in, in, in this decade are probably greater than at any time over the last 300 years. And so the kind of way we did things in the past is not going to work in the future. For instance, even in our, in our little congregation here in England, the way we do things now would surprise Anglicans uh, of, of 50 years ago. And we're seeing an effect on people being converted. We're seeing people coming to Jesus every month. And it is because we're doing things in a different way that is appropriate for the world in which we live. And we're seeing lives changed as a result. And it's exciting. And so we must see what is actually changing. Go on. And I, I think, Jeff, if you can just uh, uncover all of this uh, thing, you'll find each press 
reveals another word. So just press, uh, just uh, go on the next few, go on and fill up this table. You'll see them all fill up um, there like that. It will help me. Yes, thank you. The first thing that is ending is Western dominance. When I went to Africa, I was in Southern Africa during the time of apartheid. I arrived in Kenya when it was still a colony. And uh, a few months later, of course, it became independent. But basically that Western dominance has gone. And Jeff was sharing about even Western missionary influence is declining. That the majority of missionaries in the world today are no longer Western. So that dominance, when we could expect just because I had a white face and long nose, I could go wherever I liked and do what I liked. It doesn't happen like that anymore. And another thing that's ending is cheap travel. Most people don't realize that, but airlines went through a terrible time in COVID and many have gone bankrupt. And basically, um, business class on airlines is what gave airlines their, um, their profits. Economy travel did not. But basically, the business class has faded away because people have conferences on Zoom. And so business travel is no longer the main source of income. So that will mean that ordinary travelers, like most of us, if we go by air, it's going to cost more in the future. And then with the war in Ukraine, the cost of fuel has gone up. And so we're going to see the end of cheap travel. We have to think more carefully about how we travel. We think of privacy and how the internet has so affected us and how surveillance cameras have become a, 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 a curse really. And the Chinese have developed this to a great art now. They can they have a spy system in China, which spies on every, every inhabitant of China today. And they know what even what they're thinking. They know where they go. They know who they meet with because of this surveillance. Privacy is gone. How is that going to affect us in Christian work when we can't keep secrets in the same way? And then... Um, Objective news, we find that newspapers are not having the same influence and people just follow the bits of news they want to hear on the internet and objectivity is gone. Our old church structures are not going to work. Um, even the Anglican church is going to have to change and adapt. And basically the way we did things in the past is not going to work. Then we see other things declining. Globalization, we so depended upon trade across the world, but that is no longer working in the same way. Think of what's happening in the Indian Ocean beyond your shores with the, with the piracy that so affected um, trade going up through the Red Sea to the Suez Canal and in the Indian Ocean. And so, we find that globalization is threatened by this, uh, that, that no longer will trade routes across the world uh, work in the same way. We see, we see declines in freedoms. Democracy has not done very well. We, if I look at democracy in the UK and in the USA, there are a lot of things happening that I do not like in democracy, but that is, the least bad system yet developed in the world for governing countries, where people uh, of the country have some say in what happens, but there are still many failings. And then we find that the K recovery means that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's usually the pattern in the world. Financial giving is going down. We've got to find out new ways of funding Christian work. And you in Kenya uh, can easily think, oh, well, we need to raise money in the West uh, because we are poorer here. Doesn't work like that anymore. You're going to have to trust God for new ways of funding your own 
Christian activities and missions. It was interesting that uh, Jeff mentioned um, Northeast India. I was part of a team that went to Northeast India at the very beginning of this recruitment effort of Northeast Indians. It's a very poor part of India because they've got few natural resources and yet many very well-educated people. And we saw, we, we told churches, look, you can't rely upon the outside world to fund your missions, but you have to obey the Great Commission. And they've now sent out, as uh, Jeff was telling us, 80 to 100 missionaries that they're supporting from this poor part of India. So we need to find new ways of funding the mission effort. And often this may be by having a dual thing of going with secular ministry, secular job, for spiritual ministry. This may be one of the ways ahead. But look how much has changed too, the morphs, the changes. Ecology, we look at how, how things are changing, pollution and so on. Our whole social structures are changing. Industries are changing. Work styles are changing. And even missions. And so change is part of the pattern, and that rate of change is accelerating today. Okay, move on. And just think of the war in Ukraine, how it's affected, um, how it's affected trade in the world. And it, this is really affecting Africa in a devastating way. You can see the that Ukraine and the Russian Federation produce huge quantities of things the world needs. And you can see how with iron, nearly half the world's iron for construction and everything is basically made in Russia or Ukraine. That's all stopped now. Look at the crude oil and natural gas and coal, how much came from there. But then look at fertilizers and how many African countries rely on cheap fertilizers from Russia and Ukraine. That's all going. And then we look at the food, wheat, barley, corn. Much of the bread made in Africa is made with Ukrainian grain and, uh, and to an extent Russian grain. And so these countries have, have stopped exporting because of that war or largely stopped. And so that means food is going to get so expensive. And even the fertilizers <laughs> that are needed in Africa will not be available. And so crop sizes in Africa will get less because the fertilizers become too expensive. So you can see how our world is massively changing. OK, move on. And then global chain, uh, um, climate change. These are the areas that are likely to be most affected by climate change. Uh, this map is not correct in one respect, that the greatest change is actually in the Arctic and Antarctic, with the ice melting. But look how Africa is being affected by climate change. But Africa produces least of the uh, gases that make that climate change happen. And yet Africa will suffer the most. And that's so often been the story of Africa. Okay, move on. And here is the Sahel that I said I'd come to. Notice the Sahel is made up of um, very dry grassland on the edge of desert. That's the yellow. And then the, the bush country, really, of, uh, of the orange, where there's a bit more rain. But look at just a few incidents that I put there of people being killed in the herder farmer violence, because basically uh, peoples like the Fulbe or Fula or the, um, or the Arabs, or the Arab herders of Sudan are attacking the, the, uh, the farmers because they want their their farmland for grazing. 
And so this has caused a lot of fighting between the herders and farmers. And then came the jihadists and they took up the cause of the herders and that is also fueled the war that is going on across the Sahel. Okay, move on. But look at the river systems too. Um, every one of those colors represents a major river. And the color means, the green means it, it's secure. The, there's enough water for the purposes for which it's needed. But then the uh, yellow means it's overuse, but okay. But then the orange and red and purple are going to likely cause terrible distress or even war. We only have to think of what's happening between Ethiopia and Egypt. Egypt with a massively growing population and also Ethiopia with a massively growing population. They both want the water of the Nile. And the Ethiopians have built that huge dam and the e e Egyptians are worried. And they, they've even threatened war with Ethiopia because of that dam. And so we see conflict arising because of the population increase and the water supply probably going down for various reasons. And you can see the difficulties for the future. That is also acutely so in the Middle East and in South Asia. And you can see uh, the in rivers of India and Pakistan and Central Asia are a huge challenge. But the worst of all is the Tigris Euphrates mentioned in the Bible. You can see that purple area uh, between Turkey and the Persian Gulf. Okay, move on. And just notice that the turning points of history have often come through um, through pandemics. They just list the ones, uh, list them out, Jeff. Basically, okay, um, it ended the Roman Empire. I told you about that, uh, the coming of Islam, and I won't repeat that. But in Europe, it totally changed society from being feudal, that means lords ruling over serfs and slaves, to renaissance, um, because workers became few and they were able to lever more influence. And so that led ultimately to the Reformation and also to democracy. The empires of America were destroyed by smallpox that the Europeans brought. And what about COVID-19? What, what are the turning points going to be there? I've mentioned some of them. Move on. And so there'll be a new normal. So our faith response is, let's release the past where we need to adapt to the present and exploit the future. Look for new opportunities, different ways of working, and the methods of the past may not work in the future. So we need that flexibility. Uh, to give an example, there's a war going, going on between Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine has is smaller, uh, fewer people, less resources, but they are adapting to the present and the Russians are using old methods and losing. And that is almost like a parable for the church. Okay, move on. <clears throat> and so here we see Jesus taking us to Matthew 24, 14. And the context I've said here, the destruction of the temple, the end of the world, the expected hardships, I've dealt with them. Now we come to the promises. Because in the middle of all these negatives come some amazing promises. Okay, move on. And the first thing to say is that we have a wonderful message. Uh, move on. And this is the guy um, I mentioned earlier who led me to Jesus. 
He, he's been an Anglican clergyman for many years, but working a lot amongst young people. And he's still alive. He's now 87. And, but he was a wonderful discipler of me at university. And could I just add that, you know, one of the greatest um, things that we can do in Christian work is to disciple those we lead, to help them to take over. You know, when I worked in Zimbabwe, I wrote out a plan I had for my African team. I, I said, I want to give 10 years that they might learn everything I know and, and become efficient, mature people. And then I will have by then handed over everything to them. It took actually 11 years, but it worked. And anybody who is in leadership, who isn't constantly trying to help their congregations, their, the people they lead, to become leaders too, and to take their place, is not fulfilling the Great Commission. Jesus told us to go and disciple all nations. And, you know, how many bishops actually actively prepare other clergy to take on as bishop and school them and alongside them and help them to take over their role? The danger is that we fall into the African big chief sim, um, pattern. You know, your chief reigns until he dies and then his son takes over. That's not the biblical pattern. Biblical leadership is servant leadership to help others to take our place and multiply ourselves in the process. And we move on then to other ministry. Much of my present ministry is alongside other Christians who I long to see become men and women leading in God's work. I want to hand over everything, everything that I do, I do it with the plan of handover. And anyway, certainly Peter Marshall did that. Move on. I then um, went out to Africa, and this is, this is some of my co-workers many, many years ago in South Africa, and we worked as teams in tents. In fact, when I went up to Kenya in 1963, we, had a, we, uh, we put up a tent in Pumwani in uh, Nairobi, which was then the red light district. I don't know what it's like now, but it, I don't think it'd be much improved. And we saw many people come to know Jesus, and some went on to be Christian workers. And so that has been part of my life. This was some of my team in Zimbabwe. There's me in the middle, the only white face. And all these dear men became leaders in God's work. Move on. And Steve, the one I mentioned, is the second from the left. He was the one who became the leader of Africa Enterprise before he handed over to a Kenyan. Okay, move on. And so there's Steve again, and he wrote a book, Out of the Black Shadows, which told how he was once a teenage gangster with one ambition in life, to kill his mother, who deserted him as a little boy. And he had to live out of dustbins. But God wonderfully saved him, and later his mother, who also became an evangelist in Zambia. And anyway, Steve went on to become a wonderful man of God. Okay, move on. And here is um, what happened in Latin America. There you can see um, the Brazilian football team in a, in a World Cup and how they prayed to God before they played. Hmm, interesting. Go on. And then we see the blessing of the whole world is what uh, was intended that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world. Let's look briefly at what God has done. Go on. And there's the world in 1900. The dark red means very few born again believers. And look where most of the believers were in 1900. Move on. This is 1960, you can see the colors changing. Look at how Africa's changing. Then the next one. 
and there it is by 2000. You can see this huge transfer of the weight of the number of Christians moving from the Western world to Africa, Latin America, and Asia, the majority world, as Jeff called it. I use another term, I say afasla, um, or any, using any majority or any other thing has a little connotation of um, separation. And if you just use you, na, you for Europe, na for North America, uh, North America, and pa for Pacific, and afasla for Africa, Asia, Latin America, it's just geographical. That's all it is. That's my preference. Okay, move on. And look at Africa. There it, it was the situation in 1900. Move on. 1960. And then 2000. And look at the potential impact of evangelicals on Africa. But I would add a warning here. You know, one of my concerns for Africa is how many governments have become corrupt and where this has become a major factor in Nigeria. Nigeria could be a rich country today, but it is poor because of corruption. And I've said to Nigerian Christians, look, if you're going to affect the world, you need to be able to stand against the evils of corruption. But it's right through the church too. How do you deal with it? Well, if we as Christians cannot live an exemplary life and give a demonstration of what Christianity is and what a moral, good, honest life means for a country, we're not going to be able to have the resources to evangelize the world. Could I add this, that in 2050, Africa will be the only youthful continent and you'll have young people, many young people, who will want to serve Jesus. We don't have young people in Europe or Korea or in, 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 in Britain because our families have got so small that we'll be concentrating on looking after the old people like me. Um, but Africa will be the only useful continent in 2050. But, and it will impact the world, but you must impact your societies too. You know, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he said, um, in going, disciple all nations. That was really what Jesus was saying. We often have it translated wrongly. We need to disciple nations. We as Christians need to be leavened for God's, uh, God's plan for the world to affect the culture of countries. And I, I put that challenge to you. We need strong representatives who are going to stand up for real moral right in, in our own countries. And then we might have a society that can actually sustain Christian work across the world. Okay, move on. And look at the amazing growth rate. Move the on to the next two as well. Yeah, there we are. Notice here that peak. This is renewal Christians in millions. Look how many people became evangelical, yellow, became charismatic, uh, the, the red and, uh, red and uh, yellow, and Pentecostal, red. I mean, there's overlap between them all. But basically, we see in the period 2000 to 220 was the greatest harvest into God's kingdom the world has ever seen. That is the world in which we live. Because of the declining birth rate around the world, that number is going down. Move on. And there you can see the different branches or the stream, streams of Christianity. Marginal, Orthodox, Catholic, Anglican, Independent, Protestant. The independents are largely evangelical, but like many... Uh, independent churches in Africa, or the Anglican, kept separately here because some parts of Anglicanism are not reformed. But here you can see uh, basically where the evangelicals are. That's the yellow. And you can see how many are in UNAPA, Europe, North America, 
uh, Pacific on the left, Afasla, Africa, Asia, Latin America on the right. That's 1960. Move on. Now we see 2000. Look at the change. Now on uh, further. And this is what it is likely to be in 2050. And speaking uh, within an Anglican context, notice the problem within the Anglican communion. Notice that nearly all the evangelical, uh, the Anglican church has a majority of evangelical Christians, a great majority. But that great majority is in the, in the majority world and not in the UNAPA or the West. And so we have this conflict between a minority of evangelicals in the Anglican community in the West trying to stand against uh, the erosion of biblical standards. And that is the difficult situation Archbishop Welby is in at the moment. And he's vainly trying to stand against this tide of culture which erodes biblical standards. And that's the kind of situation we face. But that, that is the realities of the world in which we live. The majority of the effort of uh, the 21st century will be from Afasla or the majority world. Okay, move on. And here's China. You can see the amazing turning to God of China. The darker the color, the more the evangelical believers. And this has happened under communism. Move on. And here we can see um, the, what a very great researcher on China was able to put together, the number of Christians in the different provinces of China. And when you think how few Christians there were when communism came, and now it is over 7% Christian. Wow. Okay, move on. And look at Ethiopia and Somalia. There you can see Somalia, dark blue, very few Christians. And look at where Christians are in Ethiopia, in the highlands. And they've been a bastion for Christianity for 2,000 years. Uh, move on. Are you hearing me? Yes, okay. Um, I think I, I'm being heard. Um, but now move on. And now we see where evangelicals are. Notice in the southwest of Ethiopia, they had revival at the latter years of communism in Ethiopia. And now they've got a very strong evangelical church in southwest Ethiopia. Praise God. Okay. And here is a church in Nigeria called the Redeemed Church of God. And Look at this massive con uh, conference center they have between um, uh, Ibadan and Lagos. It can take, I think, three million people for an Easter conference. Look at each of those sheds there on the top right. And there's inside one of them. Can you imagine so many people meeting together to praise God? Astonishing. Move on. And you see the number of believers coming out of Islam increasing. I mentioned this earlier. It started in Indonesia. Just uh, fill this chart up. There are a whole lot of things that come up, Jeff. Just um, mark them in. Yeah, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Right, go back. Yeah. Um, and there you can see it started in Indonesia. The people started to come to Jesus when there was a terrible coup, when the, the, the communist coup failed and the Muslims slaughtered the communists in millions. And many, Mus uh, many Indonesians thought this was awful and became Christian. But then we see other great things that have affected the Muslim world up to 9-11. And look at the number of um, believers increasing to 10 million in 2010. And some reckon today it's 25 million former Muslims who are now Christian. That is astonishing. So praise God, that uh, promise of Jesus is being fulfilled. Move on. And I, I leave this, leave that one, move on, uh, leave it, go on, move on. 
move on. I, my time is gone. Go on. And then with, uh, uh, we will stop there for the, for the, for the uh, well, welcome back everyone. Uh, now I have some control over the screen and I hope that uh, it will flow more easily now. And what I would like to do is to make it possible for you to ask questions in the chat. And I will try and notice if you put on a question, um, either to store it to answer later, or if you, I, I may answer it if it is relevant at that time. So please use the chat if you want to ask a question and I will happily elaborate. And I'm aiming to finish everything within, within about half an hour, but we'll see how we go. Okay, now we move on to um, um, the, the challenge before us, what we still have to do. And for this, I am using Acts chapter one and verse eight, and where Jesus gave his last word to his disciples before he went to heaven. And this is so rarely emphasized in church life, which is tragic because this is his last message. And when he said, and you shall be my witnesses uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Um, and I want to liken these four areas and interpret it in the 21st century. Jerusalem was a city. Uh, Judea was a country. Samaria were immigrant peoples coming into the country that were hated and despised by the country where they'd come to live. Now, they'd been res uh, immigrants, as it were, in the Assyrian Empire about 600 years before. And yet they were still regarded as foreigners. And then uh, the religions, uh, the ends of the earth, the big challenges we have in the world of Islam, of Buddhism, of Hinduism, where the majority of the least evangelized people are. And so this is my emphasis in this last section. So he wants us to be witnesses. And look at cities for a minute, just... Um, Bear in mind that we are living in a very different uh, situation in the world today. When missionaries started to go to Africa 100, 150 years ago. And these are the top 10 cities of the world. And it's helpful to see what is changing. These are the top 10 cities in 2000. Um, the top city then was Tokyo in Japan. But Tokyo is rapidly aging in population. The Japanese have few children, and so the whole population of China is getting old. And so it's not going to grow in the same way in the future. So by 2025, just in two years' time, the biggest city in the world will be Mumbai, closely pursued by Lagos in Nigeria, with Tokyo down um, below them. And then you can see all the other cities, top 10 cities. And this is what it will be in 2050. And there you can see Lagos will be the largest city in the world. I, I've been to Lagos a number of times, and I cannot imagine how a city so chaotic as Lagos can function with 64 million people. That's almost, it's more than the population of Kenya today. And so there we can see uh, how cities are becoming so important in Africa too. And you only have to think of the population growth in Nairobi and how it's just exploded. But there you can see the, a map of the cities of the world and you can see the um, terminology that is used by the United Nations today. They speak about mega cities is over 1 million, super cities over 5 million, super giants over 10 million, 
and meta cities. That means they stretch so far that it's hard to grasp. Are, uh, are over 20 million. And in 2000, there was only one that was that like that red dot that was Tokyo. But what's the situation in 2050? Look how many there are also in Africa too. But look at the density of cities in China and in India. And so we see that basically we are moving into a world that is largely um, urban. And in fact, in, in 2007, uh, 2007, the urban population of the world became more than the rural. So the main focus of the 21st century is how do we evangelize our cities, which by definition are multicultural. They have many tribes, many languages. And so new languages are going to emerge. And we've got to adapt to doing ministry in cities. You know, when missionaries first went to Africa, they built mission stations. They built a hospital, schools, teacher training colleges, all sorts of things. You have them in Kenya. And that's why you have these remarkable institutions outside cities, because they started at a mission station. And so, because there were no cities really, or hardly any cities. And so that became the focus of missions. And that is the picture that many people have of missionary work, that you go to a, a mountain, a forest, a desert, to reach the least reached. But a, more and more of the least reached are moving to cities. So we've got to develop a whole new different way of working in cities. And so that we must keep the people vision right and focused, but we must also have a city vision too. And these go in parallel as we look into the 21st century. And so when you send out missionaries today, uh, just like in the New Testament times, the first place you start is the cities. And if you can disciple people in cities, they will disciple the rural areas. That is more the pattern for the future. And it's becoming also true in my own country here. Um, Jeff has been sharing about how so many churches in the West and also in the UK are emptying, got old people. And so I'm, I'm part of this movement within the Anglican church of wanting to plant or replant churches where churches have died. And so in our congregation, we've now, as I said earlier, got about 150 people, and we want to see that multiply. And then maybe in two or three, four years time, a group of us move to another area and take over a church that's died or about to die. And by God's grace, see a change take place. So we see this urban to rural is the kind of pattern that is emerging even in the West. And so basically, let us look again at what our city strategy is. Then secondly, uh, we also must evangelize countries. We mustn't forget that Jesus told his disciples to evangelize all Judea. Judea was where the Jews were. And so all Judea needed to hear. And in a sense, that is representative of the countries of the world. And how far have we got? And here you can see um, the countries of the world. Um, this is several years ago. We then had about 244 countries in the world, but about 155 of them had over 50% Christian. Now, why that is so many is because many of those countries are small islands like Samoa or um, Seychelles or something like that, or St. Helena in the uh, Atlantic Ocean, two islands related to Africa. But they are so small, but they quickly had Christians there that evangelized and they became nominally Christian. And so a lot of those countries are tiny, and but have become majority Christian. 
think of all the Caribbean islands or the Pacific islands. So basically, about uh, 155 of the 244 countries of the world are majority, at least in Christian, uh, uh, Christian in name. But amongst them are many born again people too. But then you get other countries like South Korea, Singapore, Chad, where Christians are not in the majority, but they are a very vibrant and strong minority. Um, Jeff has been um, speaking about South Korea and the challenges they face and how South Korea is now the second biggest missionary sending country in the world. That's not likely to stay much longer, I think, because of the decline in the population and the decline of young people coming to Jesus. But basically, South Korea is still minority Christian, but have done a lot to send the gospel to the rest of the world. And so the 25 countries there are those countries where there's been a breakthrough for the gospel, but where the number of Christians have still not become a majority. And very often the churches in those countries are, are quite lively and a lot of vision. But then we get another group of countries here, the 35, where there's been a lot of work done, like China and India, and the church has become, in many areas, strong. But there are not enough Christians to reach every part of the country. And so in China, for instance, we have Tibetans, Mongolians, um, Uyghur, and people like that who have got very few Christians. And some areas of, uh, where the main population of Chinese live have got fewer Christians. So they're still, to an extent, pioneer. India has got the further complication that they have a caste system. Not only have they got languages, that divide out the country, but they've got social levels of caste that are very, very hard to leave from one and go to another. And since most of the Christians come from the less favored and less advantaged communities, it means that the more advantaged financially and in power have little of the gospel. How are we going to reach them? And so in these countries, there are many sections of society that still need expatriate or cross-cultural missionary work. But then we've got a number of lands like the Maldives or Laos or Yemen or Libya, uh, 29, where there are hardly any Christians and where we still need to treat them as pioneer countries. And so there you can get some kind of idea of the um, of, of the need of the world. And here I've given a list of the countries of the world with fewer than 5% Christian and fewer than 2% evangelical. And, um, and here you can see that list. This is the percentage of evangelicals in those countries. This is the percentage of Christians. And that's the religion. Now notice again, as I showed you earlier, on that map, that many of the countries that most need the gospel are Muslim. And you in Kenya have one advantage here that you have a Muslim minority. And so you have uh, frequent contact or even daily contact with some who are Muslim. And this gives you um, some advantage when you consider ministry amongst a Muslim people. I have had a lot to do in uh, over these years in, with Nigeria and about nearly half the population of Nigeria is Muslim. So the Christians in um, uh, Nigeria are particularly well equipped to be able to counter Muslim arguments, know how to contact Muslims and relate to them and even lead them to Jesus. And one of the reasons for some of the problems in, uh, in Nigeria today between the religions is how successful Christians have been in winning Muslims. And Muslims don't like it and fight back, as it were. 
And so there are lots of problems there. But the Nigerians have become quite successful in sending out missionaries to Muslim countries. And I know hundreds who've gone to Muslim countries for Jesus. And so this is a huge challenge, but you too uh, in Kenya can have a part with that. And in fact, the Anglican Church has had over the years a huge influence on the Arab world. You may not know this, but uh, most of that effort has been very strongly biblical and a great influence. But anyway, there you can see the countries with the fewest Christians and evangelicals. But if we change it somewhat, and we, um, we now look at the countries with more than 5% Christian, but less than 2% evangelical. In other words, we're dealing with countries where there's quite a large Christian nominal population. And here you can see another list of countries, another 30 or so. And there you can see the main religion. Um, you can see the percentage Christian in the middle number column. And then on the right hand uh, column in each of the two uh, tables, you can see the religion. And some of them are Muslim, but many are Catholic. Now, I'm not saying Catholics aren't Christian, but generally in many Catholic countries, the majority of the population hasn't really um, been challenged to a personal faith that they know they have a relationship with God directly. And so, just like with uh, evangelical um, or e even with countries that are Protestant, there are many nominal Christians. And so, we find that these are the countries where there is a, a, a great need for the gospel, uh, the biblical gospel, to be exposed to countries that may have had a Christian tradition. And so there's another list of countries. Many of those are in Europe. And then we move on. So where are the least evangelized countries of the world? Now, during the 1990s, we made a strong emphasis on the 1040 window. We don't hear that expression very much these days, but it is helpful. And um, so here we can see um, the least evangelized countries of the world and the 1040 window. That's the that's rectangle, 40 degrees north of the equator to 10 degrees north of the equator. And uh, notice how some of the countries in that area are colored dark orange. They have lots of Christians in those countries, but they are inside that box. The other countries with light orange, who, which are uh, which should be in that box, but are not, and are outside it. So it's a very crude representation. So there's a great amount of need in Indonesia and in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and so on. So it's a crude way of representing it, but basically it helps us to realize that this is the area of the world that has had the least exposure to the gospel. So these are the countries that we should be thinking of for pioneer work. And uh, those are the countries outside that are needy, and those are the countries inside which are less needy. But then look at Africa. And here is a map which um, is colored by the majority religion of the ethnic group involved. So you can see the blue are the ones who follow traditional religions, worship of ancestors, um, witchcraft, a strong emphasis on witchcraft and so on. And there you can see the peoples that are still majority of ethnic religion. Okay. And um, then um, I, I, I may have to move my, my computer elsewhere in a minute. And I think I will do that now. Please excuse me. Um, my wife has, has another meeting here. So hold on. I don't know if I have to Almost. No.
My apologies. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. yes, yes. Good. We are getting um, we are. My, my wife has another meeting going on, a, a group of ladies who are wanting to be discipled are meeting in our living room. And so I've had to vacate it. Okay, and so here we see Africa, uh, the Muslim areas that are majority Muslim, peoples that are majority Muslim are shown in green. And those that are majority Christian, in, at least in name, are yellow. And the ethnic groups are blue. But notice that line, that yellow line, that is the extent to which evangelization has taken place to a great extent in Africa through Christian ministry. But then we see how the Muslims have moved south and are being quite aggressive in trying to win people for Islam. And so in between, we have the, between these two lines, we have that red indicating the conflict zone uh, across Africa, where the religions of Christianity and Islam are in contention and sometimes in conflict. But the violence is usually from the Muslims on the Christians, and that's why there's been so much persecution in this area. And we think of the jihadist wars that are going on even to today. And so um, these are the areas that really are needy for the gospel. And um, at the moment, I'm just writing an article on the Sahel and why we hear so little about what's going on. And I want to put this challenge to you that we have this, got, got this great area across Africa of the Sahel that really needs the gospel. And look at the areas of conflict. Each of these areas that are uh, the colored areas on this map indicate a kind of conflict that is going on at this moment. And you can see those that are related to Islam, ISIS linked or generic various kinds and or Al Qaeda. And notice of course, Somalia uh, with uh, well, Al Shabaab and all that they are doing in that desperate needy land um, in, in violence. And then those red X's indicate large refugee communities that are on the borders of countries where they've had to flee for safety. And there are probably 30 million uh, refugees in Africa today. And you remember how Jeff was sharing with us 80 to 100 million in the world who are refugees and 30 million of them are in Africa. So the Africa that we must evangelize today is torn by warfare. And in some cases, it's civil wars. Those are the brown areas on the map, like the war in the north of Ethiopia with the Tigray, the terrible war in Libya, where the guns go right across the Sahara and into the Sahel and have caused chaos in those countries because of the weapons that have gone into Egypt, uh, into Libya to fight that civil war. And then we've got other farmer herder ones that I mentioned earlier in that earlier map. And so, you know, when we put this challenge to you about going out as missionaries, uh, Africa is in turmoil and they need Jesus. And Africans are going to have to do more. Uh, one of my problems uh, with my white face is that I'm immediately obvious when I go to a country. Uh, but you as Africans, you may look a bit different um, to the people to whom you go, but you're not so noticeable. I mean, for years when I worked in the slums of Southern Africa, I, I, I wished I'd had a black skin or a brown skin. South Africans are more brown than black. And uh, anyway, so I think that you need to take a greater responsibility for some of these areas in Africa that most need the gospel. And then we come on the peoples, and this is something that is really quite challenging. Um, 
And one of the things that I've worked on for years with the Joshua Project, I've had a lot to do with the development of the Joshua Project list of all the peoples of the world. Do look it up on the internet. And you'll find so much information on the peoples of the world. And yet we can take those 16,000 peoples and put them into 15 blocks of peoples like Sub-Saharan Africa. I was just mentioning some of the commonalities that you have with uh, skin shade um, and, the, and culture. There are so many things right across Africa. Um, when I was in South Africa, I had learned how to speak a bit of Zulu. But when I came to Kenya, I found many of the words in Zulu were in Swahili because they are Bantu languages and that helped. So there are lots of commonalities. And so within these great things are many divisions and problems, but there are commonalities that make it the barrier to cross a boundary less acute. And so it's helpful to look at the world in that way. But in each of these um, blocks of people are clusters of peoples, like the Somalis. If you look at the Somalis in more detail, there are many different uh, clans and uh, some dialects and languages that are different, but they're all Somali. So we find these clusters of peoples. But it also helps us in planning for the future. And here is a map of the um, different clusters in Africa. Each color there represents a cluster of languages, like the green for the Nilotic. You've got the Luo, and um, uh, as representatives of the of the Nilotic, and uh, you in the, I think all of, I think all of you. But when I look at your names, I think all of you are Kikuyu. Uh, you might have a few Luo amongst you. I don't know, but in the diocese of Thika, I think that's a Kikuyu um, uh, majority area. So you're part of the Bantu, a big cluster. And there you can see the different clusters. Now, the importance of this is that when people migrate to another country, they usually congregate in these big clusters. Uh, so uh, when, the, when the Fulbe people move to France, uh, they speak a number of dialects and even languages, but they tend to congregate together and identify with the wider cluster when they move to another country which then gives us a, an idea of the kind of strategy we need to use. So that's Africa. And here's Nigeria, the people clusters in Nigeria. Uh, this may be far from you, but it's interesting having uh, the language, uh, the languages, for instance, of Nigeria shown here, uh, that it comes from the ethnologue uh, of, of Wycliffe, but now look at the way the gospel has moved. And notice how even in the Muslim areas in the north, many of the local languages represent peoples that have responded to the gospel. Those that have done least response are the dark blue, and those that have become majority Christian are orange. And the lighter blue indicates the lighter the blue, the more are that are Christian. And one of the bad areas in Nigeria today is the northeast towards Chad and Lake Chad, where the um, Boko Haram uh, jihadists have caused a lot of terror. And they have specially aimed at the Christians. And you can see how many Christians there are in the local tribes of northern Nigeria. And they have suffered acutely because of these jihadists. So that's. Um, that gives you some kind of idea. We also have a pretty good idea today of how many Christians there are in each one of these clusters. And you can see all the different clusters of sub-Saharan Africa being listed there in front of you. And you can see how what proportion are Christian, that's yellow, what proportion are uh, um, are um, ethnic religions, the, uh, the local religions, and how many are Muslims by the, uh, the green. 
uh, on those bars. And then you can see how many peoples there are, how many people groups there are in each of those categories, uh, as far as Christians are concerned. Anyway, all this will be in the video. And if you want, uh, if you want to refer back to it, do ask Jeff to be have access to all this information, and then you can process it better yourselves. But basically, we have a pretty good idea of where the needs of the world are. We have got a wonderful resource today. And here's one cluster, the Fulbe, that I mentioned earlier. Those are the different languages and tribes that represent the Fulbe. And many of them are herd, herds people, and some have become jihadist fighters. And so if the Fulbe became Christian, what an effect they would have on Africa. But the breakthrough has only come in a few countries. And uh, folk in my mission have been working in Senegal amongst the Fulbe for 90 years, and we still haven't seen the breakthrough. So it's a big challenge. Then you've got in your area, the Somalis. There you can see the Somalis, uh, the Somali cluster, the green, and overlapping into Kenya in your Northeast. And you know all too well the kind of problems that have emerged there. I hardly need describe it because it's so part of your uh, life. But look at the way the Somalis are broken up language-wise and in, um, uh, you can see there the differences. And there are the clans amongst the main Somali group. And think of the wars that go on between them. Then we can see where they, what countries they're in and uh, where they are and how few have become Christian. And then we see how many have emigrated all over the world. Um, and you can see how many uh, are refugees. So a high proportion of the Somalis are that blue in Somalia and in other countries who are now refugees. And there you can see Kenya. About half the Somalis in Kenya are refugees. And so we see um, the polit politics of a failed state. But then we have another challenge coming in the 21st century. And I just want to mention this briefly. And this is almost the conclusion of what I want to share. Um, a wonderful job has been done in the latter part of the 20th century in analyzing the languages of the world. And there you can see how many languages have been translated. And there are 7,360 living languages still being spoken. And these are the ones that have translations of the Bible. Um, and you can see over half the languages of the world still have nothing of the Bible. But you can see um, probably about 15% have got the whole Bible. About uh, a third of all the languages of the world have a Bible and, and a New Testament. And nearly half have something of the scripture. But when you look at the population, you realize, wow, um, most of the world's population has access to a, a Bible they can understand. And only, a, only about 15, 12, 15% 15 of the world's population has less than a, a New Testament. And so many of those languages are tiny. But what's going to happen in the, um, in the 21st century? And here I've just shown how languages are used. There are 6,909 languages being used in homes at the present time. I'm omitting those that are nearly extinct. The primary languages, uh, the languages used in primary school are about 1,500. In secondary school, about 450. For instance, look at the schools in Kenya. What languages do you use in secondary schools? Almost entirely English. And then Google search, when I did this, only 149 languages could have Google search done. In. And only 39 languages are used for teaching in university. Now that is astonishing. 
It means that during the 20th century, as the world becomes more educated and people become more living in cities, most of those languages are going to die in this century. Languages losses by 21, uh, 2100 is probably going to be 2000 to 4000 because people will speak other languages in cities. And so with this, I will end. Um, basically, if we are going to evangelize the world, we're going to have to think in a different way so that we can really impact the Muslims, the Hindus and the Buddhists, where most of the least reached peoples and cities are today. And refugees, uh, I won't speak more about this, but refugees are a tremendous uh, means of reaching the unreached because they move to different countries. So many have got mobile phones today. They can speak with their relatives. I know Iranians who are speaking daily with their families in Iran, and many of them have become Christian and they are witnessing to their families. But look at the refugee routes across Asia and across Africa, many going to Europe, because that's where they see an economic future is possible. But look at the problems. Think of those imprisoned in Libya trying to get to Europe. And think of the problems of Europe. There's Europe, Europe and, uh, and the North America and the Pacific. We have a population deficit. And that deficit here, oh, sorry, whoops, that population, oh, whoops, that, that, that population deficit is going to be made up by refugees or migrants. It, you can't stop it, it's going to happen. And so we have a world population that's moving, changing, and this is an opportunity for the gospel. So Jesus is sending us out into the world he's calling us and he wants us to evangelize to disciple to teach to send and he gives us the strategy those are the final words of jesus in the great commission and he wants us to be ready for jesus coming back again because the end is going to come and with this i just want to close um, there's a denomination in ghana called the church of pentecost it was started by Pentecostal Church from Wales. And the missionary went out, uh, James McKeown, and he's a missionary founder who often said to Gardeans, you can do it. And it is now a missionary sending church with 3 million members worldwide because they could do it. And uh, they recently bought a Bible school in the UK to train, uh, train folk here for Christian ministry a Ghanaian ministry in UK uh, to do that. And so that basically is my challenge. And now just uh, possibly just a question or two. Uh, Reverend Paul, you said any sensible alternative. Um, are you speaking about the, uh, the problem within the um, uh, same-sex marriage issue? I wish I could give you an answer. Um, Welby, uh, Archbishop Welby has had to, uh, he's been called to the Houses of Parliament and been lectured very strongly that if he goes in the way that he is in not permitting same-sex marriages in the church, that, that um, he's in trouble. And he said he'd prefer to uh, keep to biblical principles and not be uh, uh, not damage the worldwide Anglican communion by agreeing to a cultural imposition by a national government. So I don't know what the result is going to be, but I pray that God give a wise solution in this horrible situation. Anybody got a comment? Okay, any other questions? I see none in the chat that I can notice.
That's right. Can you, you folks? End up on, sorry. Can you just end up your share screen? Yeah. Okay, over to you then, Jeff. So any comments and any any um, ideas? Any questions that you want to ask? Anyway, I hope you'll be able to have access to the um, diagrams and the PowerPoints. And it, uh, I, I gave you so much information, you can't yeah. remember it all. Dr. Joseph or Reverend um, okay. Th Thank you, uh, Reverend uh, Joff. Yep. Uh, uh, allow me to request you to state that uh, next next Monday will be our concluding day. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Allow me to request uh, the bishop to do the concluding remarks on our behalf and then give it back to you, sir. Bishop, if you can hear us, kindly give us your concluding remarks on our behalf. We are requesting the bishop to give us uh, his concluding remarks on our behalf. Bishop, if you can hear us. Okay, maybe in his absence, we can request uh, our Venerable Joseph Wanyoike to give us the concluding remarks. Venerable, kindly. Venerable Joseph Wanyoike. Dr. Joseph, uh, before if um, before we do that, can he can I just share the announcement for next week? Very good. Yeah. Go on. Okay. So, um, okay. Yeah. So, um, so last week, um, no, next week will be the last day of our webinar. So uh, we'll meet up at the same time, 8.45 um, in the morning in Kenyan time. So uh, two um, presenters uh, will be speaking on those topics. So um, as you see, the speaker for the first session, Roland uh, Grenier, uh, he's the director of Act 13, um, based in African continents, and he, he, he's missionary in Africa. He'll be speaking on the mission movement and uh, African churches in F Act 13. And last session will be um, Reverend Bang Kyung Yu. So as you see, he's, um, he's got high, quite high profile. He's mobilization director of WEC International Mission Mobilization and former director of WEC IMM. So he'll be speaking on Mission and Me uh, next week. So Patrick, can you just end up the entire session by your prayer? Yes, indeed. Shall we pray, brethren? Loving Lord, thank you so much for the time we have had together. And I pray that that which you want your dear people to remember uh, might be retained and that it might lead to fruit for your kingdom. We don't know what way that will be, but I pray for the church in Kenya to have that vision for a world and seek to obey that final command of Jesus. 
and find the right way to do it in the times in which we live. Lord, I pray that this session might even have an impact on Somalia, on the Sahel, on other parts of Africa and the world as a result of the time together. Amen. So thank you, Lord, for your enabling grace over these years. We just pray for the Anglican communion at this time as they wrestle with the problems of um, what to do about all these pressures to change that may not be biblical. So, Lord, I do pray that you might guide the leadership to make the right decisions. We ask it in Jesus' name. When? Thank you.